East Asia Veterinary Products Incorporated is the pioneering company and one of the major companies under our EDL group of companies founded in 1992 by our President and Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Eulalio Doc Ayong Lorenzo, a veterinarian, an entrepreneur, and a visionary leader. East Asia Vet offers varied products from mycotoxin binders to natural, organic, adaptogenic premixes and liquid, including anthelmintics, antimicrobials, dewormers, and livestock vaccines. We are still continuing in our product research and development program to answer the needs of all livestock industry partners and we are committed as East Asia Vet continues to scout, innovate, and develop new products that would be cost-effective and ensure livestock profitability for all our livestock producers and farmers. As part of the corporate social responsibility of each Asia Vet, we are one of the few companies to answer the call for antimicrobial resistance by introducing natural organic products that are adaptogenic for feed, premix, and liquid. One is Zigbeer, a liver tonic, hepatoregulator, feed additive, and liquid. Another one is an immunomodulatory and stress optimizer feed powder and liquid called ZIS. And more importantly, we are the only wound spray for use in many farm animal species that are all natural and organic, safe for human and animals, which can stop fly, maggots, antibacterial activity, antifungal, and anti-edema. For and in behalf of the leadership and management of our ideal group of companies, together East Asia Veterinary Products is here and always in support to all our business partners, our livestock farmers, for more profit, and sustainable agriculture. As we always say, the Philippine Livestock Agriculture is Asia that is one with you as the best is yet to come. Ayon. Hello, Dr. Raquel. Isang magandang hapon sa'yo at sa ating mga kawebisyo viewers na imbag ng malem tayo amin apo. Yes, um, Dr. Jeanette, um, magandang hapon sa'yo. And of course, sa lahat ng mga um, sumusubaybay sa atin at mga kasama natin ngayong hapon sa mga kawebinar natin, magandang magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. And thank you, thank you po. Um, sana tuloy-tuloy ang pagsubaybay nyo at pagsama sa amin sa buong episode ngayong hapon. Dr. Jeanette? Yes, Doc. So, Doc, ito, um, napakaganda ng ating magiging usapan ngayong hapong ito dahil ang ating topic ay about sa parasite ng mga small and large ruminants. So, pag sinabing parasites, napakadami talaga niyan, Doc. Napaka uh, mahabang uh, usapan niyan pag sinabi nating parasitiko. At napakaswerte natin, Doc, dahil nga makakasama natin ang isa sa pinaka-special na bisita natin ngayong hapong ito dahil mamaya ipapakilala mo siya, Dok, no? Sa so yung ating magiging uh, speaker for this afternoon at napakaganda na marami tayong matututunan kasi alam natin na konteping uh, trivia, Dok, sa ating bisita mamaya, siya ay nagtuturo. So, ibig sabihin, marami tayong matututunan ngayong hapong ito. 
Totoo yan. Exactly. Totoo yan, Dok Jeanette. And kasi, nagtuturo siya. So, ibig sabihin, continuous. Um, hindi na yung mga makaluma lang na, na um, tungkol sa parasites, kundi even yung mga bagong development na rin. May mga discoveries na bago na. Um, yun, um, kasama yun. And speaking of parasites, syempre, Dok Jeanette, syempre, internal and external yan, mga ganan. Um, kasi baka iniisip natin uh, minsan, ano lang yan, worm lang yan, mga ganan. So, mamaya, Tama. maliliwanagan natin lahat ang ating, um, ang ating uh, topic ngayong hapon. Kaya, stay tuned kayo. And, Dok Jeanette, tama ka, privilege tayo ngayong hapon to kasi um, napakahalaga ng oras sa ating um, speaker ngayong hapon. Pero, Tama. nag-take time siya na um, mag-share kasi um, gusto rin niyang mag-reach out sa mga kasamahan natin sa industriya na may agam-agam may mga tanong tungkol dito sa pag-aalaga ng ating uh, ruminants. Ang uh, mga baka, kalabaw, kambing, tupa. And also, Dok Jeanette, um, nag-take time din siya para naman maibahagi din ang kanyang kaalaman dito uh, pagdating dito sa parasites ng small and large ruminants. Okay? Yes, and look, siyempre, Huwag natin kakalimutan, Dok, no? yung ating mga kababi show viewers. Pwede po kayo uh, maglagay mamaya ng inyong mga comment, suggestion, and or questions po para sa ating uh, guest ngayong hapong ito. At Dok, eh, dito sa amin pala, dito sa Norte, no? maganda ngayon yung mga um, pagpapalaki at pag-aalaga nitong ganito mga klase ng ruminan, lalo na yung mga baka kalabaw. Pero konting ingat lang, Dok, no? uh, reminder lang, announcement lang sa ating mga kababi show viewers. Kasi po dito ngayon sa aming lugar, especially sa Isabela, marami po yung mga nagkakawalaan ng na mga baka. Na, nawawala talaga do. Ang dami niyan ngayon dito sa amin. So, konting ingat lang po, konting bantay sa mga alaga natin kasi mahirap na ang mawalan ng mga ganyang klaseng alaga ng hayop. Ayun, Doki. So, Dok, yes, dumadami yes. tong ating mga viewers. Ah, pa- oo. Oh, oh. oh, oh, Dok, ang dami-dami na nila dito. So, huwag na natin patatagalin. Siguro, Dok, yes. i-introduce mo na. Ipakilala Sige. mo na ang ating speaker yes, ngayong Dok hapon. Yes, Tama. Tama ka, Dok. Napaka-privilege. Ito ang mga kadahilanan kung bakit privilege tayo um, ngayong hapong to kasi makakasama natin ang, um, ang ating um, kaibigan at kasamahan din sa linya ng veterinaryo. Siyempre, siya ay babae. Katulad namin ni Dok Jeanette. Kaya girl power kaming... Um, kami ngayong hapon. Yes. At kasalukuyan siyang dean ng College of Veterinary Sciences and Medicine sa Central Luzon State University, so CLSU. Pero um, itong mga maganda niyang achievements, siya ay nag, um, nagkaroon o kumuha ng masteral MS, masteral degree sa UPLB, Veterinary Medicine, kung saan nag-specialize siya sa parasitology. And then yung kanyang PhD, Dr. Jeanette, ay sa University of Edinburgh sa United Kingdom. Wow! Kung saan nag-specialize siya sa immunoparasitology. And yun naman mga research involvement niya, ay eh, tungkol sa mga small ruminant research and um, sa proficiency of animal um, in uh, parasitology. So, ibig sabihin talagang very, very, um, siya ang tamang tao para ngayong, um, para okay. sa ating topic ngayong hapong to. So, um, without further ado, Dr. Jeanette, we have the privilege to introduce our guest speaker to, for today, Dr. Virginia M. Venturina, PhD, or we call her Doc Gigi. Welcome po, Doc Gigi. Hello, Doc Gigi. Good afternoon po. Ayun, Doc. Nakamute po ata. Doc, mukhang nakamute mic. si Doc Gigi. Doc Gigi. Oo nga, Doc. Doc. Doc, mukhang nakamute si Doc Gigi. Oo nga, Dok. Ayan, inaayos ata po ni Oo, Dok Gigi. Oo, inaayos ni Dok Gigi. So, nakita nyo ng aming girl power ngayong hapon. Sabi ko sa inyo, eh, girl power kami. Dok Gigi? Uh, okay ka na, Dok? Yan! Na po, Hello, Dok. Yes, Hello. Dok Gigi. Okay na, Can you hear me? Okay. Dok, uh, yes. Okay na po. Uh, yes. Dumati ka muna. Pasensya na po. At actually, a few seconds. Hmm. Yes, oo. Before anything else, I would like to thank uh, Miss Janet and Miss Raquel here, and of course my classmate Dr. Rolly Incarnacion for giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, some uh, advances, or should I say, some basic information that our farmers may be interested to know. Uh, sa ngayon po ang ating uh, magandang pagkakataon ito dahil uh, we can reach out uh, uh, mas marami. 
maraming tao through this platform. Ano? Congratulate the East oh Asia Vet uh, products for coming up with this kind of uh, seminars at uh, kami po ay uh, bukas puso na gustong tumulong sa ating mga nag-aalaga ng mga luminance. So I hope uh, today will be a fruitful day for all of us. I hope you will learn from the uh, uh, short talk that I'm going to uh, deliver today. And uh, even after this talk, no, uh, you can still reach me. And hello, Doc. Doc Gigi. Doc Gigi. Yes. Ayun, okay. ayun, okay na. So, medyo mukhang naputol lang tayo ng konti doon, Doc, no? So, yun, Doc, maganda talaga yung nabanggit ni Doc Gigi, no, na itong ating ganitong klaseng ginagawa na trabaho ay to talaga ma-disseminate yung mga information na dapat malaman ng ating mga uh, racers, mga farmers, ganyan. So, napakaganda talaga nito. And, Doc Gigi, we are very excited po sa inyo pong presentation at gusto rin po namin talagang matuto pa at the same time, pati po yung ating mga kasama ka web show dito na nanonood ngayon. Napakarami nila, Doc. Ang dami mo na agad mga viewers ngayong hapong ito. So, siguro, uh, inaabangan din nila inyong presentation. Ayun. Totoo. Totoo yan, Doc Jeanette. Um, habang nag-aayos ng connection niya si uh, Doc Gigi ngayong um, hapon, eh bakit naman hindi mo na tayo mag-shout out? Kasi ang dami na nila. At may nabasa akong first. Yung ating suki, Doc Jeanette, suking-suki, first agad. <laughs> Siyempre, ang ating ano, Team Mindanao, once. Okay, sa ating Excellence Poultry and live, Livestock Specialist, ang ating um, kapitapitagan, sabi nga ni Doc Rolly, na Area Operations Manager. Sampu ng kanya mga kasamahan, syempre, si Sir Jobert Montejo. Yes, Sir Jobert, thank you po sa lahat. Hello, Sir Jobert. Yes. At saka, kung may sharer badge dito, number one sharer din itong si Sir Jobert, um, Doc Jeanette, ha? Maya natin tama, shout out yung mga kasamahan niya. Oo. Yes. Yan, Yan, Doc, Yan Gigi. Si Doc Gigi. Okay na, Doc, no? Doc Gigi, okay ka na pa? Ayan. Okay. Tap, pero, ang mga nag-aayos ulit. <laughs> Oo, Doc Jeanette, may, ano, may message sa atin si Sir Jobert. Yamang siya ay first. Okay, yes, Doc. <laughs> Doc okay. Jeanette, Doc Raquel, pa-shout out na lang sa mga key accounts at trade outlets sa Mindanao na nagdadala ng ating mga produkto. Opo naman, Sir Jobert, ikaw pa. Eh, ikaw nga ang lagi yes. first. Oh, yes. Oh, Doc Jeanette. Doc. Doki, eto na. Unahin ko na yung mga pa-shout out ni Boss Jobert, no? So, hi and hello po. Thank you, thank you sa panonood. Kila DVD si Davao Emma Antipuesto Mutia, EJ Agrivet. Hello po, Ma'am Emma. Good afternoon po. Ipil Ruby Galatan, Dennis Bacaro, Arman Melomida, Glyn Banay Banay, Luz Patap, CJ Sayamek Jensen Medeline, Tilia Josie Haveliana, Garcia Enil Maongat, May Pakunla Pakot, Aloni Lantikse, Jonathan Lantikse, Farmers Agrivet, Marvel Agrivet, Farmers Agrivet Supply, Lolong Conde PMC Digos, PMC Mati, Madang PMC, uh, Tibanban PMC, Butuan PMC, Tagum Bonifacio PMC, Ampayon PMC, Midsaya PNC, Agrivet M Lang, MPC, and Bansalan. So maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo pong panonood. Ayan. And ito pa, yes. Doc, no? Uh, Diretuhin na natin kay Sir Jumar Aranyo watching right here in Davao City. So magandang hapon, Sir Jumar. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo pong pananood. At syempre, Doc, ang may share badge din si Sir Ronnie Fernandez. Good afternoon po. Isang magandang hapon din sa iyo, Sir Ronnie Fernandez. Salamat po sa pananood. Okay? Doc Raquel, baka yes. kami mga nakikita ka pa yes. ng mga viewers. Oo, oo, meron naman. 
nakaraan at hindi nakatiis ang pamangkin ko. Matagal na nagpapa-shoutout si Sofia Abby Silva Lyson. Good afternoon po, Abby. Good afternoon. Hello And po. good afternoon din sa lahat. Yes. And ito, si Sir Willard Villena. Good afternoon. I'm BSA, so baka Bachelor of Science in Agriculture, BSA3 student from BIPSU, oh. Biliran Campus. Sir Willard, thank you po. Um, stay tuned lang po. Um, Ito, very productive itong papanoorin mo, sir. Makakatulong yes. po sa'yo. Doc Gigi, okay na po ang connection natin? Yes, bumalik. Bumalik na. <laughs> Aalisin ko na ito. Ito yatang ano, airpad ah, na dulo ko. But anyway, airpad. nakapasok na rin ako sa laptop. Sa laptop na ako nakapasok. Hmm. Yes, Doc. Very good. Thank you. Dok Jeanette, ano, Sige, Dok. Uh, tutuloy na natin kasi Dok, ang dami na nag-aabang, Dok Gigi. Kaya nga, yes. marami na nag-aabang sa presentation ni Dok Gigi. So siguro, putulin po muna namin yung pag-shoutout sa mga viewers po natin ngayong hapon. Proceed po muna tayo sa presentation po ni uh, Dok Gigi. Dok Raquel, kung okay ka na dyan. Yes, the floor is yours, Dok Gigi Venturina. Hey, Doki. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, East Asia Vet for inviting me to be a part of this conference. This afternoon, I'm going to share with you the common parasites of small and large ruminants. For the information of everyone, I am, the, uh, I am one of the faculty members of the College of Veterinary Science and Medicine in CLSU. And uh, I am the one in charge on parasitology subjects. So I am happy to share the uh, common parasites of ruminants. I know that most of you are veterinarians, but I think you will agree with me that when you were in your undergraduate, you are not really paying much attention on uh, parasites. Is it? Uh, probably the reason for that is because you have to memorize a lot of scientific names. And uh, for us veterinarians, we think that uh, we should be trained as critical thinkers. That's why those subjects that would uh, entail a lot of time for us to memorize things is really not very, uh, uh, very attractive to us or something that we need to, uh, that uh, we focus on. So today, I'm going to give you a, a refresher on these uh, parasites and uh, how important are these parasites, not only for us as veterinarians, but for others who are um, farmers, who are uh, technical advisors, uh, those who are uh, the stakeholders of animal health. Okay, let me start by uh, sharing the status of the population of ruminants in the country. So if you look at cattle, buffalo, goat, and sheep, you know, these are the uh, more common ruminants that we encounter. You know, we have some deers, but uh, we really don't uh, raise them uh, ordinarily. If we do see deers, they are in uh, zoos. But uh, for livestock production, we have cattle, which accounts to 2.5 million of uh, the population of ruminants. Then we have buffaloes at 2.9. Goats are a bit many. You know, there are about 3.7 of them. But for sheep, which is considered as an infant industry, uh, there are only about 30,000 of them that are recorded. So these are just the population of uh, ruminants, and these are very few compared to what we see in, in swine and in poultry. So with this uh, population, majority of this uh, population is being raised by backyard farmers. So if you look at these figures in cattle, buffaloes, goat, and sheep, it is primarily under backyard setting. And uh, this may be uh, considered as uh, 
one of the reasons why uh, the management of these animals are not really um, are not really uh, prioritized by uh, racers because um, the uh, setting in these uh, areas in the small hold farming system is not uh, very convenient in terms of resources. And so uh, this is where we see most of the problems in worm infections or in other parasite infections like external parasites. So there should be a sustainable worm control program in any of this ruminant management system, whether it is in a backyard or commercial operation, uh, we need uh, a control program that can be uh, that is workable, that can be sustained, and uh, which would lead to a productive ruminant production. Now, the reason the reasons why uh, we really need to have one that is workable is that uh, these ruminants, you know, from goats to cattle, buffaloes, they have high risk of being infected and being reinfected. So it's like there would be a continuous uh, cycle of infection to these animals. And another is that there is there are associated production losses with parasites. And uh, in most cases, these are not really given much attention because most of the losses are attributed to morbidities and very few lead to mortalities. So people are unaware, I mean, the farm raisers are unaware that uh, there are actually losses that are ascribed to parasitism. And the third is the development of anthelmintic resistance. This is now a global problem that we should uh, really put focus on. And that is why uh, it is important for us to understand the uh, the system that should be in place when we deal with these parasite infections. So I will discuss this one by one. First, that ruminants are prone to infection and infection. One reason for that is because we live in a tropical setting. Our country is a haven for the free living stages of the parasite. So in the life cycle, before the parasite reaches or establishes itself in the host, in the animal host, it has to stay outside the host, which if there are adverse conditions outside, it may not lead to the successful um, reproduction or propagation of the parasite. However, in the Philippines, almost throughout the year, the microenvironment is optimum such that the free living stages are favored. And so that in mind means that even if we uh, treat the animals and we do not consider the stages of, of the host, there is a greater chance or a great chance for these animals to get reinfected. So that's one. Another is for most of the backyard racers, most of them are mm, in middle class or uh, living in, uh, I mean, uh, it low, uh, well, not really in poverty, but uh, low income class. So most of them do not own lands, their own lands to uh, allow their animals to graze. And in these cases, a communal grazing area is almost always present in uh, these rural areas and uh, in, in many of these backyard grazing operations. So again, even if we are giving um, focus on uh, treating the animal only and not looking at these things, the, 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 uh, the risk that the animal can acquire the infection is high because if that communal grazing area is uh, being grazed by animals that are seeding that area with 
the infective stages of the parasite or the uh, seeding the pasture with the eggs, then it also would predispose the animal to reinfection. Okay. Now, another factor is that these animals that are, uh, are uh, being raised by smallhold farmers, most of them are, do not have access to good pasture. They are not provided with, uh, with uh, improved uh, forage. And uh, feed supplement is very rare. So we expect that these animals are not uh, in the best level of nutrition. And when they are in that state, if they acquire infection, their level of resilience is not very high as well. So if they, in, they are not uh, properly nourished, if they get the infection, it is more likely for them to manifest parasitism. Okay, so that's, that is one of the uh, reasons. The next is that we cannot do away with worms when we talk about ruminants because the main source of food or the main type of food that they eat is grass. It is their staple food. So these grasses are also the places where we can get, they, where they can acquire the infection because the infective stages of the parasites are found on those grasses. So it is inevitable that they could acquire this infection and that is why it should be, the, the, the worm control program should be built in, in any of this management system. Another point to consider why we really need to have a sustainable worm control is the economic losses that we can ascribe due to parasite infection. These losses could be due to lowered performance. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, animals that have, uh, we can look at this photo with, uh, they, they look very emaciated. It takes time for them to reach their market weight. You know? When they have parasites, you know? because uh, these parasites are competing with their nutrients. And uh, for the meat or the milk that they produce, these are also affected in the presence of parasites. For example, in the study just done recently, you know, in 2020, in which they looked at the effect of uh, giving the warmers to dairy cattle and buffaloes that have gastrointestinal parasite infection and look its effect on milk production. So in this study, they were able to demonstrate that uh, when the animals are dewormed, it increases the milk production by 14% in cows and 8% in buffaloes. That's, that's uh, a very high increment. And uh, they also observed that the protein in the cow's milk have uh, considerably or significantly improved. And the lactose and solids that are present in milk of buffaloes are significantly increased as well. These are just one of the uh, many studies that prove that um, these parasites have a negative effect on the production of these animals. And uh, it was also, it has been established also that uh, the parasites, these parasites, they have uh, an effect on the reproduction efficiency of the, of the animals. No? In fact, in the uh, study done in uh, 2015, uh, they have uh, in this review, no? in this review by uh, Tenakis et al., they uh, mentioned that uh, there are several parasites that could lead or lead to the delay of puberty. You know, the onset of puberty can be delayed. And uh, there are also certain parasites that can uh, cause this, the test test to degenerate. You know? I think this applies to um, mange infections in, uh, in rams, you know, which can cause the degeneration of the, the, the testicles. And uh, poor consumption rates have also been associated with the presence of 
different parasite species. So effect on the production of meat and milk reduces for reproduction efficiency. And also when they have parasite infection, they become prone to other infectious diseases. So these are these uh, all, uh, all leads to lowered performance due to parasite infection. Now, other losses that we can associate with parasite infection is the additional expenditures that we have to do because of the, the condition that they have. So in this case, we are prompted to give until mintics to them. Well, unfortunately, in, in many cases, these uh, treatments may be prolonged, or in some cases, these treatments fail so that the animal would eventually die, even we have already made these interventions. And uh, when we, uh, sometimes, you know, especially for farmers, they would really opt to, uh, need to uh, seek the uh, help of uh, veterinarians or to seek technical advice from, from animal technicians to which they need to, uh, to spend or to, to, to uh, pay some fees for them. So these are additional expenditures that would also lead to, uh, to add to the losses that are associated with parasite infections. Now, I mentioned about antelmintic resistance because uh, uh, earlier, because this is also one of the reasons why the, uh, the interventions in terms of treatment fail. No? When we talk about antelmintic resistance, this is, as defined, would be the uh, ability of a worm, no? because of its genetic makeup that, is, uh, that develops by selection pressure through time, the, these worms tend to survive the effect of the antelmintic given the usual or the, the, the required dose to them. So in a population of uh, parasites that are present in the animals, if more than 5% of them survive after treatment with the antelmintic, that could be considered that, that it may be considered that there is resistance to that until mintic. So these um, genes or these genes of being resistant to that particular until mintic can be passed on to the next generations. And that is why it is really important to identify if this is a problem in the herd and make sure that there will be interventions that you will do for this to be addressed. Because uh, globally, there are many reports of uh, antelmintic resistance with to several to several antelmintics, and in fact, even with a combination of them, to several different uh, among several worm species. Um, I have uh, for me, I have done some studies on uh, this in goats and in buffaloes, and in these studies that uh, focused on. Um, uh, benzimidazole and uh, triclabendazole, albendazole for against fasciola and against nematodes, um, there was a resistance development that was seen in these treatments. So if we consider antelmintic resistance as a problem, there are several factors that contribute to it. No? But uh, probably the most important one would be the frequency of the warming. For many of the farmers, especially if they think that these uh, these dewormers are free, they tend to give dewormers as often as they could. No? In fact, in the in the survey that was done uh, in in uh, 1999. No? Uh, I'm actually part of this uh, initial work. It was found out that um, for about for over eight years before 1999, in the survey, the uh, the farmer or uh, the uh, technical advisor or the vet or the uh, paravet 
recommended albendazole three to four times per year you know, for, by these vets and other uh, technical advisors. So it is uh, evident that uh, there is a massive use of this uh, uh, until mint take during that time. And so I did a study after this, and uh, it was then the, the, the publication that showed earlier, it was then that uh, I found out that uh, in these goats that were that, that have been using albendazole for the longest time, they, the efficacy of uh, albendazole range only from 50 to uh, around 70%. You know? So it, it's not only that, uh, after that we did a follow-up study and uh, we looked at these farms which we, uh, where we saw a low prevalence and uh, it turned out that uh, even after six years when we returned to the farm, there was even a lower uh, a lower um, efficacy of these drugs. Even if they say that uh, they have made some interventions, they changed the drugs, but uh, the performance of these antelmintics in terms of efficacy did not improve. So apparently, there is an indication of uh, non-reversion of uh, antelmintic resistance. And it's very, it, it, that is very saddening because uh, it takes several years for companies to develop an antelmintic, an effective antelmintic, and it only takes a few generations for it to be ineffective due to indiscriminate use. So another, another um, practice that is being done by many farmers is to perform blanket deworming. Again, this is done in cases when uh, they get a free until mintics, which are also being given by, by um, there are LGUs that can provide such, no? they provide free deworming sometimes. No? So if these are done, even if the animals have just been recently dewormed, they just, uh, they just uh, want their animals to be redewormed again. So th this is not really a good practice, and uh, sometimes also the farmer would uh, the farmer would buy an antelmintic that is good for like ten animals. If he has twelve, then uh, he will divide this uh, amount or volume of uh, antelmintic to be divided among twelve of uh, the animals that needs to be dewormed. So that leads to underdosing, and uh, that also is one factor that could lead to resistance development. Okay, now let's look at the common parasite infection of ruminants. And we'll start with haemonchus or the wireworms. This affects all ruminant species, and this is found in the abomasum. It is considered as the most common of all the, uh, well, of all worms that are found in ruminants and uh, among, uh, among round worms as well. So the prevalence could be about 60 to 100%. And uh, this parasite is acquired primarily by ingestion of the infective stages, which are found on the blades of grasses. So when infected ruminant has this infection, it passes out the feces and then hatches into larvae, which develops outside the host until it reaches the stage that is infected. And this usually takes about um, four and a half to five days under Philippine conditions. So meaning when the animals um, deposit their feces with the eggs, all it takes is just four days and then presto, you have the infective stages on those vegetation. And they are seen as droplets of water. They just need a, a film of moisture, a film of water for them to be able to swim and climb up and crawl on the blades of grasses. Now, how pathogenic is this wireworm? The worm is really, um, uh, well, it is primarily a blood sucker. 
but uh, it's not only it's not only a blood sucking at its adult stage, but even in its pre-adult stages. No? And uh, they have this dorsal lancet. No? It's like a, a very, uh, I mean, a pointed structure through which they uh, lacerate the blood vessels of these uh, of, of the in the intestinal mucosa or the abomasal mucosa rather of the animals so that is when they produce anemia no? when they lacerate the the blood vessels and they suck in the blood and these worms can lay about 5000 eggs per day no they are they have very high biotic potential and uh, their ability to suck blood can be about 0 0.05 ml per worm per day. So they really could cause anemia because of that voracious blood sucking activity. So the effects would be anemia, no? severe anemia in affected animals. No? We'll see that in uh, goats or sheep. Uh, we see the bottle jaw edema and we see the pale mucous membranes, the conjunctiva and the gums. And uh, when they do have these infections, um, we, we see that the animals tend to become weak. No? They tend to um, become listless. And uh, in young animals, in, in very young animals especially, the animals, the uh, pre-weaning kids or lambs or calves can become severely infected and uh, in, in the most severe infection, they really could be could, could die due to severe anemia. The next common parasite, the, the next uh, parasite is the nodular worm. No? The, the, these nodular worms are found in the large intestine of ruminants. Now we find it in cattle, buffaloes, sheep, and goat. And it is responsible for the condition called pimply gut. So sometimes when we uh, slaughter these animals, we see these nodules on the serosal layer, and uh, it is also actually present in the mucosal layer. No? So these, there are very many of these nodules. They appear like uh, a pimple. That's why it's called the pimply gut. No? These nodules, they only develop with uh, reinfection. Actually, um, these are like abscess, no? with the larva in them, larval stages in them, and uh, some of them may successfully reach adult stages. Otherwise, they are sequestered in these nodules until they die. So these nodular worms are uh, also important in that uh, if you look at the surface of the mucosa, they tend to really occupy a large space in the mucosa, which can lead to malabsorption. Next, we have trichostrongylus. No? The trichostrongylus or the black scar worms, they are also important in ruminants. No? They, are, they are seen in the, the uh, abomasum. Some of them are seen in the intestine. And they are considered as the most common, uh, second most common strongyls that are present in ruminants. Just like hemonchus and the uh, the hemonchus or the wireworms and the nodular worms or esophagostomum, they are acquired through ingestion of the pasture with the infective stages on them. So uh, there is no intermediate host required for this parasite. So it is very easy for these parasites to spread and to, be, to, to infect other animals. So how do we control these common strongyls in ruminants? So one is we need to really ensure that uh, the antelmintics that we have are optimally optimally used. No, we we should be discriminate when when we uh, when we recommend the use of antelmintic. We don't really need to recommend blanket deworming, but uh, we can uh, just identify those animals that are having a, a very high infection. No, based on uh, fecalysis then we can recommend its use. And uh, we can also employ the use of some, uh, actually some leaves of trees and uh, legumes that, are, that have known um, antelmintic property. No? Because we, have, uh, we provide to these animals not only grasses, but we also give them uh, leaves of trees, like for example, mangoes, 
um, ma- moringa or uh, malunggay or um, kakawati leaves. These are normally being given to these animals. And uh, we have studies to show that they are they can reduce the uh, level of worm burden to these animals. We can also practice rotational grazing, no? considering that uh, the eggs of these parasites, when they are uh, deposited on the, on the pasture, it will take um, some time for the larva to develop. So we should uh, not wait until that day, no? let's say on the fourth day before they, they develop into the uh, infective stage, we need to move the animal to another paddock, another uh, place. We can divide the uh, grazing area and uh, so that when they come back or return to that uh, same area where they were, then uh, these larvae may have died, no? Because they have they need they have a parasitic stage. They need to find a host. If the hosts are not there, they can die, no? And uh, also, it it gives time for these grasses to grow again, no? For uh, after that period. And uh, we also need to improve the nutrition, the level of nutrition of the uh, the herd, because it will not only be uh, good for their uh, nourishment, but also it increases their resilience to uh, the effect of the parasites. Meaning, um, they can uh, they can uh, what they cannot uh, manifest the severe degree of parasitism when they have a high level of nutrition. So that can be done by giving feed supplement or uh, making sure that uh, we have an improved forage garden that uh, we can uh, have a continuous supply of these uh, grasses to our animals. In other countries, they, are, they, they, they have some uh, animals that have been uh, bred to become resistant. Now, in the Philippines, no, we had this study in, in goats that uh, the native animals have um, more resistance to parasites compared to the purebreds. But of course, you have to really, uh, I mean, uh, we want to upgrade the animals as well. So if we upgrade the animals, we also have to upgrade our level of management. No? So uh, being resistant to the parasite is one, but we can still uh, reduce the infection by uh, several other interventions. So we also can uh, use, um, uh, just, to inf- uh, just to share with you that uh, I think 10 years ago, we did a study on the nematode trapping uh, fungi that are used to uh, as a possible control method for, for the parasites of goats. And we were able to identify some species that have potential, but uh, apparently uh, it, it seems difficult to mass produce these uh, fungi and to ensure that uh, they, they, they are in that state because it, it needs to be incorporated in feeds. And uh, it has to go through several different steps, a process before it can really be, it can reach the commercial proportion. So uh, we did not pursue on this uh, on this study. So it's also important to disseminate the information to farmers on the uh, the control measures, the, these parasites that they are they, they have to deal with, no. They have. We, we should encourage them to attend seminars that would uh, enrich their knowledge, and um, it, it is also uh, one practice, one good practice to uh, to win the uh, young animals uh, earlier and uh, place them in separate pens, and uh, this will also reduce their exposure to their to their uh, dam. Because uh, sometimes they are the source of infection to the young animals. Okay. And uh, as a practical approach as well is uh, to clean the pen regularly. No? And uh, when it comes to the time of grazing, no, we have uh, we did a study before wherein we measured the level of larvae in uh, grasses 
at uh, each time of the day. And we found out that uh, towards the middle of the day, no, until 10 o'clock in the morning, the uh, larvae on the grasses are reduced no, because they tend to, uh, to cr crawl down when the light is when I mean, the sunlight is already uh, up. So uh, with that information, uh, we recommend the farmers to uh, allow the uh, allow their animals to graze. You know, at least for goats, for them to graze uh, not very early in the morning. You know? That is when we say there's a saying that the early for birds, the early bird catches the worm. It same is true with the goats. The early goats that graze that graze catches they catch the worm no so the time of grazing is also important and uh, if let's say um, you want to just uh, do cut and carry these grasses to uh, your stall fed uh, animals it is also good to allow these grasses to wilt no? not to give them directly but to allow them to wilt so that uh, if there are any uh, larvals, larvae that cling on the grasses, they will fall off you know, if once they dry up. And uh, it is also good to limit the access to uh, communal grazing. And uh, if it's not possible, um, you may just tether the animals and move them from one place to another where they have and then provide the grasses to them. Okay, next we have the liver flukes. The liver flukes or fasciola is also another common parasite in the Philippines. And um, it primarily affects ruminants, although other animals may also be affected. It lodges in the bile duct. You see them in the bile duct, but the immature flukes are found in the parenchymal tissue. Um, it is uh, usually a chronic infection, but there are acute cases that have been seen in buffaloes. And we have some cases also at the small ruminant center when the uh, animals just suddenly die. And uh, when we uh, perform necropsy, we'll see a ruptured uh, liver capsule uh, with extensive hemorrhage. So that's an indication that there is a severe or acute uh, fasciola infection no? because we find several of these worms on those animals. So in the, in the, the life cycle of liver fluke is different from the uh, ones that we've discussed earlier in that uh, this needs um, an intermediate host, no? and that is these nails for, it, for the life cycle to complete. And uh, the animals acquire the infection when they happen to ingest the infective stage the metasarcaria, the one that you see on the right here, that is the metasarcaria, which becomes insisted on the blades of the vegetation. So inadvertently, once the animal happened to ingest those, then uh, they become infected and the worm enters the intestine and then uh, into the liver capsule where they mature in the bile duct. And then uh, these mature flukes would lay eggs again, and the life cycle continues. Okay, it's important to understand that uh, without the snails, they, they cannot continue to live. And that's why even if, let's say, we introduce one animal in the herd that has liver fluke infection, even if, defecates, if it defecates around and uh, passes on these eggs of liver fluke, if the snails that are necessary for the for this hatch larva to uh, penetrate on are not present then it will be the end of the life cycle okay so um, in the same manner even if these uh, snails are have been infected and uh, they have these stages on them and they are placed on one area if there are no hosts that will be that are available on the site then there will be continuity of, of life cycle as well. So how fast can these liver flux multiply? In the life cycle, in the stage where they are in the snail host, um, they multiply several times. And uh, given that, 
it means that for a single egg that is being passed out by these worms, it will give rise to several, several new individuals. Huh? Because um, each adult, in its in, uh, th these adult worms, you know, the adult uh, liver flukes, they are hermaphrodites. So they produce about 8,000 eggs per day. Now that's the minimum number of eggs. And uh, in the larval stage, in subsequent larval stages in the snail, they can they can reproduce even in its larval form so that uh, each of these eggs can produce about 650 sarcaria no? just one egg and uh, if you will multiply that with the minimum number of eggs that can be potentially produced by each adult fluke it's like producing about more than 5 million more than 5 million of these new individuals from a single egg. Well, of course, that are just uh, these are just figures, no? Because we know that uh, outside the host, or at, in any stage of its development, there's a chance that they will die, no? So even if that is really if, if that is possible, let's say if only ten percent of them will survive, no, which is really low, we still get high number of these parasites on uh, available at the pasture. So this is really something to think about. You know? So when you have fasciola in your herd, that's something to really uh, put a serious thought on. Now, this is something that you need to manage. When it comes to the effects of liver fluke infection, you know, it would depend on the host because, well, the liver is damaged. You know, it will lead to... Uh, to diarrhea, they, they, there could be dehydration depending on the degree of infection, and you will uh, see your animals tend to lose weight. No, they don't reach uh, the market age as it should. And uh, well, it depends on the horse because uh, apparently the sheep and goats have low resistance. No, say so, uh, they have uh, they are prone to high level of infection, and uh, they are also prone to acute infection, but for cattle and buffaloes, they tend to have delayed resistance to infection. And that is why most of the infections in these animals, particularly in cattle, would be uh, a chronic type. You know? However, if we compare cattle and buffalo, when it comes to uh, being prone to infection, of course, buffaloes uh, tend to wallow on water, you know, on mud, and uh, they tend to have uh, easy access. I mean, they have easier access to grasses that must have been infected with the metasarcaria. So the, the chance of infection in these animals are higher. So the control of liver fluke would uh, be, one, we need to identify and uh, treat positive animals. So if we see animals, uh, many of them are suffering from diarrhea or some of them are emaciated even if they are given a good uh, uh, forage, then we need to look into them, you know, perform picalysis. And um, for the Linnaeus snails, if we have a problem on fasciolosis and we see a lot of these snails because they are seen abound in uh, fish ponds, in rice fields, in uh, in practically any place where there is uh, there is some water, um, Limnaeus really abound, and this is not really the species of snails that are edible. No, although some people would eat this, but these are very tiny and the flesh is really very small. No, so if you cook them, it's like uh, you, you you almost uh, you cannot see the the flesh anymore. No? So some people would eat this, but if they just put some vinegar on it or some. Uh, some lime, and then uh, they eat it that way. You know? So the control, the, maybe the biological uh, way to control them is to to uh, raise ducks that would uh, feed on these snails, which is a good source of protein for them. And uh, for the for the areas, you no, know, for the pasture area, well. It's, uh, most of the time, it is impractical to fence off infested areas. But uh, if this is really a problem, we may need to uh, 
to meet, to uh, introduce or to make some interventions when it comes to their grazing, if they need to rotate to uh, rotate that. Okay, next we uh, discuss about tapeworms, no, the Monyasha species. These worms are uh, found in the small intestine. No, they are very large. No, you cannot miss them if they are present. And uh, because of their large size, they can actually lead to uh, to the malabsorption. No, that's one. No, because they could uh, they could uh, cover the large area of the uh, the surface of the intestines, and uh, it can also cause mechanical obstruction no, because of their size, and uh, that could lead to uh, uh, bloat to these animals. No? So we see them as, uh, in, in buffaloes, in cattle, in goats and sheep. And uh, in, uh, when, when we treat them, no, uh, it is, um, well, we have to make sure that the, that the, uh, the drug that we use would uh, loosen the hold of the uh, head of this tapeworm, no, because uh, unless we, unless the hold of this head or scolex of the tapeworm is removed, uh, they will just regrow and regrow, you know, and become uh, become long, you no, know, continue to to increase in uh, in length. So the life cycle of these tapeworms would require uh, the intermediate host, the forage mites. You know? So the eggs are ingested by the forage mites. And in the forage mites, the larva develop. So when, the, when this forage mite, uh, they, they uh, become attached on the blades of grasses. So again, inadvertently, the pruminants would uh, happen to ingest them. And uh, that is when the uh, larva is freed and they develop into adult parasites. So the interventions here is, uh, well, it's not, it, it's not really as easy as uh, you think about it because the forage mites are in the in the vegetation so some people would um, would uh, recommend really uh, uh, plowing the soil i mean uh, plowing the soil so that uh, the stages of the mites would be interrupted no? because uh, that that is where they they stay so their life cycle life cycle can be interrupted in that manner so that has been, uh, and in some places also, but which I don't advise, they burn the pasture and uh, that would, uh, uh, they do this to have a regrowth of these uh, grasses, but when they do so, they also kill these forage mites. Next, we have the whip worms. Now, these are also common. Uh, this could, we, we can observe that uh, these animals may have, uh, uh, sometimes they have frank blood. No, um, we see these are parasites found in the lower intestine, and uh, sometimes the blood of these uh, the the feces of these animals become tinged with blood because of these uh, whip worms. And uh, we also have the uh, large round worm of cattle and buffaloes you no know, these are again we cannot miss this this is the largest intestinal parasite of uh, cattle and buffaloes and uh, these parasites tend to be depending on the age of the animal they tend to migrate uh, in other tissues of the body you know? so we look at uh, this infection that be, uh, can be acquired if the animal is uh, well is old, then the, the most likely cause of infection is by swallowing or ingesting of these eggs from the uh, contaminated food and water. So when the cows happen to ingest that, they, uh, especially if they are pregnant, they will, they will, uh, th these larval stages will migrate to the tissues. And when they are pregnant, it could uh, uh, it goes to the mammary gland, and so when the uh, calves uh, take in milk, you know, or colostrum, they get infected because the larval stages they remain in the milk for about thirty days. You know? Whereas for calves, 
the mode of infection for calves is through the colostrum. And uh, when that is, uh, when the infection is acquired through the milk, the maturity of the worm becomes quicker compared to when the calves ingest the infective stages from the uh, contaminated food and water. Next, I want you to focus your attention on toxidiosis. This is also another important parasite. No? Um, most people or most farmers think that when they have this, uh, when the animals are showing signs of parasitism, the first thing that comes into their mind is it must be worms. No? So they tend to give antelmintics and uh, aside from being uh, the possibility of having antelmintic resistance, it is possible that it, they are not actually uh, using the right uh, treatment because uh, they must they could be dealing with coccidia which do not really uh, respond to the ordinary antelmintics. So this parasite is important to young animals and uh, for sometimes even if you don't employ any treatment they can survive or not they cannot uh, lead to severe infections it could be self-limiting but uh, this is immune related so if there are stress factors that are uh, faced by these animals, they can uh, lead to severe diarrhea, dehydration, and uh, it could also be fatal in uh, severe infections. So the buildup of the parasite is high, and uh, well, it is something that uh, we need to, uh, to make sure that the animals will not get continuous infection because um, the infective stages are on the soil, on the pen. No? They are so once they uh, have this infection and there is no uh, interventions done, no? they can just continuously acquire the infection and lead to a high parasite buildup. So these are the possible effects of this infection. You see the the um, mucosa that can uh, become that would have these lesions. And that would um, also lead to folding and corrugating of the mucosa. And uh, this will uh, lead to diarrhea no? and uh, in severe cases, uh, dehydration. So how do we diagnose these kinds of infection? No? So we can perform fecalysis. We can demonstrate the eggs. Uh, the larvae can be uh, demonstrated by larval culture. And uh, we can also do count egg counting to demonstrate the degree of infection. And uh, we can also show the uh, level of uh, pack cell volume, which is indicative of anemia. And for uh, there are there are several worm species. When we talk about degree of infection, we should also consider that these eggs, uh, these worms, have different uh, biotic potential. Their their egg production is different between species, so we need to look into that. And um, there is this uh, scoring system that is employed in sheep that uh, we also did a study on goat. And uh, it, apparently it can be done. No? They use this chart. We call it an anemia guide. This study is, uh, it demonstrated that uh, when you use this chart, uh, it could be an, uh, a, uh, a basis or a criteria for you to say that, do I need to dose the animal with an antelmintic or not? No? by just looking at the color of the conjunctiva, which um, in a previous study have been shown to be associated with uh, hemonchosis. So if you uh, rate it as, let's say, uh, one, then uh, there is uh, no need to dose. Uh, number If it's two, uh, red, pink, and colored, it's acceptable. There's no dose given also. But if it's in the third, number three, that is uh, could be the borderline. So you need to look at other assessment uh, procedures for you to decide whether to give an antelmintic or not. And then uh, if it's uh, pink, white to pale, that is when you give an antelmintic right away. So external parasites are also uh, encountered in uh, ruminants and uh, it can be uh, transmitted by direct contact. You, know, you see if the animals have ruffled coat, they have some scratches, wounds that develop due to these scratches. And uh, the best way is to uh, apply some chemical treatments here and to uh, encourage bathing, especially with goats. And uh, we also encounter mite infestations uh, and uh, the, through direct contact. 
that is also one uh, important uh, parasite that we need to uh, deal with. And uh, I would like to end my presentation with uh, by saying that a happy farmer produces food for a happy consumer. If we have a sustainable worm control, we increase the profit, we reduce the worry of these farmers, and we have a happy farmer farmer that who is providing food to our consumers. So with that, thank you very much and good afternoon once again. Thank you. Ayun, Dr. Raquel, napakaganda ng presentation ni Doc Gigi, no? Napakarami ating natutunan. Pero, Dr. Raquel, baka pwedeng uh, post muna tayo para yes, makapag-rest uh, si Doc Gigi. Ano, Dr. Raquel? Uh, pero babalik tayo for the Q&A, Dr. Gigi. Yes. Dr. Gigi, ano? Apo. Um, okay. So, okay. Konting patalastas lang yes. muna. Oh, sure, sure. Apo. Go ahead. Isa sa mga sakit na dumadapo sa mga small ruminants ay ang hemoseptisemia. Anong klasing sakit ito? At paano ito maiiwasan? Hemoseptisemia is a common disease of small ruminants like goats, deer, and carabaos. Ang hemoseptisemia ay isang sakit na laganap dito sa Pilipinas. Ito yung mga sakit na tumatama sa lahat ng edad ng mga ruminants. Pag tumama ito sa ating mga hayop, ito yung agad-agaran natin nakikita na lang na namamatay 6 to 24 hours. Rarely yung nakikita natin na nakaka-recover. Ang prevention lang talaga is yung pagbabakuna natin. Kaya dapat pakunahan natin ang ating mga alaga gamit ang Hemosep WC. Magbigay ng 2 ml per animal when it reaches 3 to 4 months old. Afterwards, magbigay ng booster shots every six months to ensure the full protection of your animals. Basta't mabakunahan ang ating mga alaga ng Hemosep WC, mas kampante kang malayo sila sa malubhang sakit. Ayun, Doc. We're back, Doc Jeanette. Ayan, Doki. Yes, Doc. And Doc Gigi. Ayan, Doc. Doc Gigi, ito ang dami. Yes. Ayan na pong mga nakapilang question po para sa inyo. Okay? okay. Na, ayan, napakaswerte natin kasi kasama natin si Doc Gigi, no? So, ito po. Uh, diretso na muna tayo sa question, Doc Raquel, bago tayo mag-shoutout sa mga viewers natin. Ito po galing kay uh, Alan McCarthy Flores. Okay? Good afternoon. I have a question, sabi po niya. Is para ang pistomum survey the rumen fluke endemic in the Philippines? Ah, yes. Yung ampistomus. Uh, actually, yung para, para pistomums, para pistomum survey is only one of the species. But uh, there are several other species of ampistomus that are prevalent in the Philippines. We see this, if you go to the slaughterhouse, and uh, you uh, watch, uh, when you examine the rumen, the reticulum, you'll find a lot of those in normal animals. So what I'm saying is these types of parasites are actually usually non-pathogenic. And I say usually non-pathogenic because as I've said, you see them in normal animals. They don't seem to manifest any sign, but uh, they are there. No. So the uh, point is, uh, it can be pathologic or it can cause some problems in the in the host not in its adult stage but at the stage when they are immature no kasi andun sila dun sa rumen pero bago sila pumunta doon they stay in the small intestine and when they are in the small intestine Solution. So, nagkakaroon ng enteritis. So, nagkakaroon ng transitory diarrhea, yung hayop, no? But eventually, when they reach the rumen where they are found, no? Pag nakita mo yan, talagang namumutik-tik, they are colored pink. And uh, ang ganda sa akin, no? For a parasitologist, I find it beautiful. Maganda tignan, Doc. Maganda tignan. Maganda tignan. 
you know, uh, even if they're not really that pathogenic, in fact, if you give treatments for fasciola, no, fasciola is really pathogenic. So if you give a treatment for fasciola, nasasama na rin dun yung amphistomes, you know? Kasi whether we like it or not, talagang parasite pa rin siya. So somehow, it can compete with the host nutrients. Pero if you look at scientific uh, studies, they're not really considered as a highly pathogenic parasite. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. So, yun, Sir Alan, yung uh, you. sagot ni Doc CG. Ayan. Dr. Kel, may mga question pa? Yes, meron. Actually, uh, Sir Alan, thank you. And um, Doc Gigi, ang galing po ng pagkakasagot. And um, happy viewing daw from Tarlac. Thanks, best friend and classmate din, Gigi Venturina. Siyempre, galing kay Doc Rolly. Hi, Doc Rolly. And may tanong po siya, kasi Doc Gigi, ito yung Hello, kalimitan. Hello, Doc Rolly. Kalimitan na. Kalimitan namin na i-encounter din sa field kasi nga dito sa um, sa East Asia Vet meron kaming uh, mga dewormer. Um, what is the youngest age for small and large ruminants to be given until mintiks? And what particular kind of dewormer and why? Then, for prevention, how often should ruminant farmer deworm every year? Okay. So, uh... If, if you listen to my, you know, this uh, discussion, uh, <laughs> we, our approach when we uh, give the warmers is it has to be strategic. You, ha you should have a strategy. And a strategy in one farm may not be the same strategy in another because each farm has their own management system. Each farm has their own uh, resources. No, So those are the things that you need to consider. So... If uh, let's say we'll deal with goats, if uh, if the um, the dam has been dewormed, no, before before uh, kidding, no, bago siya mga anak, nabigyan naman yung kanyang mga yung nanay, so that means uh, doon sa kanyang mga anak somehow uh, hindi siya uh, lesser yung exposure ng kanyang mga mga kids, ano, around. Kasi let us always remember doon sa mga sa mga dams. I, uh, there is what we call periparturian rice in uh, egg counts. So, no? uh, meron yung, uh, yung, yung mga parasites when the uh, mother is pregnant no? before, during, and after pregnancy. Nagkakaroon ng phenomenon wherein the parasites tend to become morphicon. No? Pag sinabing morphicon, let's say if they are only laying, uh, let's say, a thousand eggs, each time it can increase three times you know up to five times you no know? so from 1000 it could be 5000 so ang ating approach jan is we need to prevent these eggs from being seeded to the pasture by by giving until mintik to the dams at kailan yon no before faro uh, before kidding no before kids i'm not two two to three weeks before my kid now, yung kids naman, if let's say hindi intensive yung management mo, yung uh, kagaya ng the other uh, backyard tracers kung kailan nang maisipan, no? uh, you also look at the setting. No? If the animal is completely confined, no? wala ka, nandun lang siya, naka, nandun siya you, get, you provided housing, wala naman silang access doon sa mga grasses, there is really no need for you to give any uh, any dewormer no? if it is completely confined. Kasi there is no possible source of infection. If there is, maybe if you just um, brought in the animal, no, you bought it from somewhere, and then you introduce it to the herd, and then you don't know if the animal has been dewormed or not. No, If there is a way for you to ask, that's good. But if not, uh, you need to, if there, uh, you can assess. No? Sometimes you just look at the appearance of the animal and somehow you have an idea. Pagka makulot-kulot yung balahibo, tapos pale yung mucous membrane, payatin, uh, you suspect that they have parasites. So, uh, in that case, you might need the first time. You know? Pero if they are confined completely, I see no need for them to give any until mintik. In fact, we have tested that. No? When we had a project in Pangasinan, uh, we were offering different approaches for worm control. And uh, in one farm setting where they completely confined the animals, would you believe that for the entire year, there was zero worm load? No? Because they only collect the grasses from their own uh, pasture area where there are no other uh, goats that graze on that area. 
and they collect leaves from grass eh, from trees so there's no way for the worm to reach the trees no so they just cut the leaves of uh, uh <clears throat> kakawate mango no several of these types so there, there was no need to deworm no but in the usual setting that uh, the animals are allowed to graze in communal areas no so you don't know if the other animals that are grazing the same area are all, are also treated i mean uh were they given treatments also you have no idea so the chance of reinfection is high so in that case you can give one before the onset of the rainy season uh, because uh, i mentioned earlier yung mga pre free living stages you know? once the eggs are passed out on the soil it will take about four days for them to hatch and become infective you no know? become infected to the other animals but uh since uh, in the Philippines, we have uh, like a year-round supply of worms, actually, because we have a humid environment. We never have a dry environment. So even during uh, dry months, no, I mean, not rainy months, we still have a film of water on grasses, so they can still survive. So in that case, you give this until mean uh, if there is a defined uh, rainy season, at least a month before the rainy season, because the rainy season is the months where there are more chances for these parasites to to develop no mas malaki yung rate and, and rate of reinfection so in that case if you uh, give uh, until mean take a month before the onset of the rainy season you reduce the number of adult population in these animals so the adult population is reduced and so with the number of eggs that they can seed in the pasture so and then after that Again, we need to consider they might develop resistance to antelmintic if we keep giving. Because uh, there are several studies that have shown that. The frequency of antelmintic treatment should, is uh, almost always the major cause of uh, resistance to the drug. So it, after that uh, initial uh, giving of antelmintics, then uh, <clears throat> you can uh, sustain the low worm count by providing some uh, some grass, uh, some leaves of trees that have known until mintic property. Ano yun? Yung pang, ano mo na lang yun? Pang boost yun mo na lang yun para ma-maintain. Or you can provide uh, mango leaves, achuete leaves, katuray, uh, these uh, pineapple crowns. No, These are the things that we can feed to the ruminants that have nutritional value and at the same time, until mintic property. Now, uh, we have also demonstrated that, no? that uh, in that particular, uh, for that particular farmer that adopted that technology, that's what he did. And indeed, the worm load was lowered no? with only one treatment of, uh, one until minted treatment for the year. Now, in some cases, of course, animals have their own uh, immune response as well. No? If let's say we have a herd or a flock of sheep, and you expose them to the same level of uh, parasite infection, they will not respond similarly. You know? Some of them may acquire the infection and succumb to it. Others would just become resilient and they seem not to manifest any sign of parasitism. And that is why it is important for you to, to observe the animals as well. Even with the initial treatment, if you have this, uh, if you still observe animals showing signs of uh, parasitism like some are weak, some are emaciated, some have ruffled coat. Well, you have to look to these animals and examine further. If there is a chance for you to submit the uh, fecal samples for analysis, for you to be able to assess uh, the degree of infection, that can be done. But if not, you can just make ocular inspection and you can, uh, well, if there is a vet around, you can ask their advice before giving another dose of the antelmintic. So it, it's on a case-to-case -case basis. And that's why uh, when we deal with this, uh, especially with ruminants, as I've said, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, for these ruminants to be worm-free, but we can control it. And uh, that entails a lot of, uh, of uh, effort in looking at the, uh, the real situation that's going on. No? Let, let's not look at one angle only. You know? Parasite is one, but uh, the management is very important for you to uh, to assess whether you need to give antelmintic treatments.
Thank you. Iyo, napakagaling, napakaganda ng explanation ni Doc Gigi, Doki. Yes. Ganun pala yon, case to case basis yon. Dapat strategika, depende sa sitwasyon, sa available na resources, Correct. tsaka sa programa na meron yung farm, ganun yon. Mm -mm -mm. At hindi, hindi dapat kopyahin kung, kung ano yung bahay mo. Yes, <laughs> ko kopyahin mo kung ano yung dewar mo ni Pedro sa ring sa iwan, hindi po ganun. <laughs> Mm -mm. So maganda yung paalala ni Galing Doc na gano'n, napakaganda. Yes, and Doc, may mga tanong ka bang nakikita dyan sa iyong, um, sa iyong... Doc, dito sa screen ko, okay ako na ako, wala na akong question dito. Ako din sa part ko, very ako uh, satisfied ako dun sa presentation ni Doc Gigi. Ako din. Ultimo yung mga per parasite talaga, naglista ako dito ng mga, oh, oh. alam mo yung refresh talaga sa atin Totoo. during college days tayo oh. na yung mga parasite na ganyan, na ganito ganyan. So it's a good thing na ma-recall po lahat yung Doc Gigi. And yes. mainam din po na naisishare natin ito ngayon sa ating mga yes, viewers. Yes, Doc. Totoo yan. Alam mo, dun, ako, dun yun namang nag-stick sa akin, yung ano, yung um, yung antihelminthic resistance. Kasi sikat na sikat ang antibiotic resistance, alam natin yan. Pero, yung antihelminthic resistance, so dapat aware na rin tayo. Meron yan din. Update, hindi lang sa antibiotic nagkaka-resistance sa ating mga alaga, dapat alam natin yan. Even yung mga dewormer Correct. na ginagamit natin, meron, nagiging True. resistant din sila dyan. And kung nakinig kayo dapat kay Dr. Gigi, very, very himay. Oo, very himay. Mm -hmm. Yung mga, ano, ang mga uh, discussion niya. Yun, Dr. Gigi, paano ka maraming pasasalamatan? At sana hindi itong... Si Doc Rolly. Si Doc Rolly ang bahala dyan, no. Doki. Okay, no problem. Oh, oh. Happy to help. Okay. Oh, Do yes. yes, thank you, Doc Gigi. And natuwa din kami kasi hindi lang sa four corners ng classroom na um, muna i-share. Mm -hmm. Yes, oo. Oh, oh. Kasi ano eh, ang ganda ng credentials, Doc Gigi. Ah, Siyempre, ang ganda ng credentials mo. Talaga. Ah, kami nga, mm -hmm. napawaw nga kami ni Doc Ginette dito. So, hindi lang sa four corners ng classroom, Doc Ginette, no? Um, Nag-extend na si Doc Gigi to reach out nga Alright. yung mga farmers natin through this platform. Tama yon. And Doc Gigi, sasabihan na natin tama, yung mga tama. webinar viewers natin, yung mga hindi umabot o di kaya ay yung uh, may nami sa episode ngayon ni Doc Gigi. Um, may YouTube channel po kami sa East Asia Pwede. Vet. So, nandoon po yung recorded na. Pati sa Facebook page po namin Pwede dito ni Doc Gigi Doc. sa East Asia Vet. Yes, anytime, anywhere. Pwede yun. Okay? Yeah. Doc Gigi, uh, maraming maraming salamat. And so maraming salamat po, din. Doc Jeanette. Okay. Sa uulitin, Doc, yes, talaga. Doc sa uulitin. Yes, Hindi lang in po ito. Of, yung... yeah. Yes. Time Not na pag ano mo sa amin, Doc. Yes, hindi po ito. Oh, so, mangungulit pa kami doon sa schedule mo. Ano, Makikisingit kami. Totoo, sisingit okay. at sisingit kami. <laughs> Doc Gigi, in behalf oh, of Miss Asia, tama. but syempre ni Doc Ayog Lorenzo at ng ating uh, ni Doc Rolly Incarnacion, um, maraming maraming salamat po. The pleasure is ours. Maraming salamat din. next time po. Thank okay, you, thank you, bye. Doc. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, bye. Okay, Dok Raquel. So, yes. ayun, commercial oh. break muna tayo, Dok. Mukhang oh, oh. overtime oh, na naman tayo, oh, oh, no? Tapos siya shout out lang tayo sa glit after ng commercial break, no? Yes. Uh, babalik po kami, shout out kami. Sige po.
Ayan, Dok Raquel, ito na naman po tayo sa atin pong final message, take-home message sa tayo, Dok, para sa ating mga kawebi show viewers. Yes, opo. Um, yes, um, unang-una ang mga kawebi show. So, ka-webinars, maraming salamat sa pagsama sa amin ngayong hapong to. Um, and kung matatandaan nyo, um, last week, um, yung tungkol sa hemorrhagic septicemia and gaya naman tungkol sa parasites naman ng ating mga ruminants. So, um, ito po, eh, parang sequel ang ginagawa namin. Um, Nilalagyan namin ng magandang um, istorya o sequel yung ating mga webinar, Doc Jeanette. No? Um, kaya salamat sa pagsubaybay nyo ngayong hapon. And um, yung gusto ko lang ding um, i-impart sa atin. So, ibig sabihin, ang pinaka-common talaga na sakit or number one, na nag, nakaka-apekto sa performance ng ating mga alagang ruminants ay ang mga parasite. So, um, about internal, external parasite man yan, kasi sila yung nagiging kaagaw ng ating mga alaga sa mga nutrients na sana ay nagamit or na-convert na ng ating mga alaga sa energy para ma-perform ang kanilang mga functions at magkaroon ng magandang production and performance union. So, um, para, pero be careful din sa paggamit ng um, dewormer kasi sabi nga ni uh, Dr. Gigi, meron tayong anthelmintic or dewormer resistance. Kaya um, be careful din and kumonsulta po tayo sa ating mga pinagkakatawala ang mga konsultant at veterinaryo. Ano, Dr. Jeanette? Tama yun, Dr. Raquel. So, napakinggan natin yung magandang programa nga ng mga uh, pwede nating i-offer sa ating mga ka-web show, no? Doc, uh, baka makalimutan natin, meron tayong available po sa ating kumpanya, yung ating pong Ruminex na albendazol base po ito. At yun nga po, yung binabanggit ni Doc Raquel na resistant. So, ibig sabihin po kasi ng resistance, kung yun pa rin at yun ang ginagamit na pang deworm sa mga alaga po nating hawa, yun, nagiging resistant po sila, ibig sabihin hindi na po umi-effective yung gamot na binibigyan natin. So, kailangan po natin ng iba pang dewormer na pwedeng magamit or i-rotate para sa kanila. Meron din po kaming levamisol hydrochloride na kingpurga. So any of the two, pwede niyo pong gamitin yung ating pong Ruminex na albendazol base at saka po yung ating kingpurga na levamisol hydrochloride po ang kanyang laman. So pwede po yun para po hindi sila maging resistant ita until mintik. So yun, Doc. Doc, eto may humabol lang. Magpapatingkyo lang kayo saglit kay Sir Salmo Jausali. Masiglang panonood sa lahat. Si Sir Jezreel Bakalso. Uh, thank you sa information on how to deworm our animals. Thank you to our resource speaker, Doc. Yun ang banggit niya. Ayun, Doc, yung aking... At saka si Sir Santino Corlone, watching from Tarlac City Top Vet Agrivet. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello po, Ayun, sir. Doc. Yes, yes Doc. And si... Yes, si Nessie Estayane nanonood din yes, habang so. nagda-drive. Hi, Nessie. And of course, yeah. um, yes, oo. And of course, si Doc Ben Gayares nanonood. Doc Ben, thank you. Thank you for Hello, always Doc. watching and supporting. And ayan, so ayan yung mga nandito sa end ko. And si Sir Jerry, Jerry Tanyedo, kitang-kita ko kanina yes. from Norway. Oo, Norway. lagi yung yes, suki Doc. natin yan. Nagsichat nga siya, nagtatanong siya kung kailan daw itong mga ganitong web show natin. Ayan, Ay, nanood Sir na Jerry, po. thank you ha. Thank you po. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. And Ayun. may nakalimutan ba tayo? Dok, nabati mo ba Oo, lahat nga, yung um, pinapabati ni AOM um, boss uh, Jobert Montejo oh, sa ating Doki. ating Mindanawans? Oo, kasi oh, mas sisipag din silang mag-share. Yes, mag-share nitong ating mga webinar. Okay, so thank you, thank you po sa panonood. Ayun, Dok, yes, ang uh, take-home message ko na lang, Dok, para sa ating mga ka show is that yung binanggit kanina ni Dok TG na hindi kailangang kopyahin o gayahin yung mga deworming program ng kung ano na yung narinig natin ganun. Hindi po. So, case-to-case -case basis po yan. Huwag po tayo gaya-gaya kasi po hindi po natin alam kung ano yung actual na sitwasyon ng alaga po natin mismo mga hayop. So, doon po tayo magbe-base at kung... Uh, kailangan po talaga natin mag-deworm, mag, -de -worm, mag -de -worm po tayo kasi po kawawa din yung ating mga alagang hayop. At syempre, yung banggit nga ni Dok Gigi na 
happy farmer dapat. So, dapat happy din yung mga alaga natin, mga hayop. Napakarami pong produkto ang pwede pong gamitin sa pagde-deworm. Hindi po kailangan gumastos ng napakalaki para po in that way makatulong tayo sa ating mga alagang hayop, ma-deworm sila, mas magiging healthy sila, mas magiging productive po, mas magiging happy ang lahat. So, yun nga po, meron tayong Ruminex at saka yung ating King Purga, pwedeng-pwede pong gamitin para sa pagde-deworm. And after po ng deworming, pwede po tayo magbigay ng ating hemorrhagic septicemia vaccine. Maganda po yun na iprograma. At bago po magbigay ng hemorrhagic septicemia vaccine, meron po tayong ZIS para po bago ang mga vac vaccination na yan, bago yung pagbibigay ng mga medication na yan, maganda po na nakakondisyon yung ating mga alagang hayop sa pamamagitan po ng pagbibigay ng ZIS as supplement po para sa kanila. So, yun po, huwag natin tipirin ang ating mga alagang hayop para hindi rin po nila tayo titipirin. Ayun, yeah. Doki. Yes, oo. Tama, tama yung ZIS. Speaking of ZIS, Dr. Jeanette, um, honestly speaking, syempre, before vaccination, nilalagay mo sa, um, sa, sa kondisyon ang iyong alaga. So, alam naman natin, anti-stress yan. So, magkakaroon ng stress kasi magkaka-vaccination. So, gumamit tayo ng ZIS. And after vaccination, gamitan din natin ng ZIS kasi very stressful din yun. Um, yan, ilan lamang sa mga programa um, na meron kami um, kung saan um, isineshare namin sa inyo kasi very effective sa amin dun sa mga, sa mga trial na nagawa namin. That's so, isineshare namin sa inyo. Um, pero ito nga ay case-to-case -case basis, pero um, you can always um, consult o pwedeng magtanong. Ano, sabi ko nga lagi huwag mahihiyang magtanong, katulad sa mga webinar na ganito. So, Dong Jeanette, um, alam nating OT tayo kasi ang ganda ng topic yes, natin. Yes, Doki. Oo. Oh, oh. Pero, pero kailangan din natin mag-promote kasi yung ating tukan at kabuhayan, uh, Dok Jeanette, um, ongoing pa rin to sa ating um, sa TV sa um, sa every yes, Doki. Saturday and Sunday. Yes, Dok Jeanette. Apo. So, ang ating tukaan at kabuhayan show po, mapapanood po ito sa One Sport Channel, Channel 41 on Free TV, Channel 6 on Signal TV, Channel 59 on Sky Cable, every Sunday, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. po yan. At may replay telecast po siya sa gabi naman ng Sunday, 9 to 10 p.m. at 10 to 11 p.m. naman po kapag Monday to Saturday po ng gabi. So, mapapanood po ang ating tukaan at kabuhayan. Yan, Doc. Yes, thank you, Doc. And also, also sab siyempre yung aming online store, ano, www.edl-store.com. So, um, wag na wag niyong kakalimutan, pwede kayong mag-purchase um, at your own um, convenience, kahit online. nasa ng bahay. O, oh, oh, yes, just a click away. Um, yan po, um, click nyo lang po yung um, aming... Um, website and then uh, makikita nyo na po dun yung mga produkto. May specific na um, instruction po, may description. Kompleto po ang information na nandun doon. And then, um, isang click din lang para ma-deliver sa inyo via courier. Walang alisan sa tayo. Hindi na kailangan makipag um, siksikan ngayon. Okay? Correct. And syempre, Doc, yung ating um yung ating um YouTube channel which is na sabi na natin kanina sana po yes, um, so, lagi kayong manood doon ng mga episode yes kung may gusto kayong balikan nandun lang din po yun sa um, East Asia Vet um YouTube channel ano YouTube and kung um, nahihirapan kayo sa YouTube dito po sa Facebook page ng East Asia Vet and even sa mga personal accounts po namin ni Doc Jeanette um yes, Doc Rolly, po, uh, share yan. po namin itong um, ating yes, webinar so. and i-share nyo rin po like and share po para mas madami tayong ma-reach out kasi tuwang tuwa si Doc Gigi eh madaming nare-reach out <laughs> talaga sa classroom ngayon correct Man. okay correct, and correct. ano pa yung peking duck natin Doc Jeanette alam ko yan oh, oh, ang favorite yes, niya yes po nako napakasarap niya ang ating peking duck ang ating mga duck ha so available po yan, napakaraming klase ng putahe po. Uh, yun, Doc, pwede rin nila ito uh, online na i-order sa atin, sa yes, EDL store yes. natin. Available din po yan. So, uh, i-search nyo lang po, makikita nyo na po yung mga different na uh, putahe, ganyan, iba't ibang klase prima po. Prima-duck, yes. Uh, po, prima-duck. So, pwede nyo po yan yes. makita din sa ating online store. So, ayun, uh, yes. Doc, pasalamatan mo okay. ng ating mga yes. dapat Yes, siyempre lahat ng viewers, um, Tim Mindanawan, Sir Jobert Montejo, always first, and siyempre yung mga kasamahan natin dyan, ang ating mga kliyente, yes. sharer, at saka yung mga tumatangkilik ng ating mga produkto, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, Team Excellence, siyempre, Sir Choi, Choi Montejo. I see Ay. Sir Choi um, Estanislao and um, Sunny. Um, yes, and Nasi. Sir Sunny Nasis of um, Team Visayas naman. Sir Choi, huwag mo akong papagalitan ha. Yan, and then um, also, <laughs> naghalo yung apelido nila. And also, syempre, yung East Asia Vet family natin, headed by Doc Rolly Incarnation, syempre, team Correct. leader natin yan. Correct, hello Doc Rolly. And, 
yes, and nakakalimutan lagi natin, Dok Jeanette, yung mga tao sa likod ng ating camera, na literal Correct. na sa likod ng ating camera. Yes, Sir Ian, syempre. Um, Sir, Sir Ian, Ian. Thank, you, thank you so much. Um, and then, um, Ma'am Kim, Ma'am Kim Rivera. And, and syempre, si, um, si uh, Sir Joshua. Thank you. Sir thank Joshua. you sa inyong tatlo. And pa-shoutout pala kay Ma'am Emberbano nga pala. Lagi ko nakakalimutan. Yes, hello, Ma'am. Ma hello. Yes, so Dr. Happy, Jeanette. happy, happy always. Yes, okay. Ayan, sila ma'am M. So, yan. Yes. So, Mag okay na, na ako, Dok, dito sa part ko. Oo nga, yes. nakamukhang ano. So, Dok, no, sa susunod na naman. Mm. Yes, mm. so sa susunod po, hindi, uh, yung posting ng ating uh, schedule po ng ating web show. So, hindi na po tayo every week. I-remind lang natin sila, mm. Dok, no, na hindi na every week. Ito, yes. so maybe after, every other week po, itong ating yes. sa East Asia Vet na web show po natin. So, next week po, Farm Champ naman. So, alternate po tayo yes. magkita. Lagi namin kayong i-remind. Ano po? Okay, mag-alala. Okay, maraming salamat okay, sa pagsama nyo na, ngayong hapon. And, Dok Rodi, hello. Um, Dok Jeanette, katulad ng laging sinasabi ni Dok Laging binabanggit. Yes. yes. Philippine Agriculture. Agriculture, the best is, the best yet, is to yet to come. Thank you po. Thank you po. Ingat po ang lahat. Yeah.